Thank you all for joining us today, today's forum, to promote college access and affordability. I especially want to thank and recognize Senator Chris Coons for his leadership and persistence in reintroducing the American Dream Accounts Act in Congress, along with Senator Marco Rubio. These senators are demonstrating that even in these challenging times, challenging political climate, there are Democrats and Republicans willing to work together to secure a better future for the next generation. My name is Mark Edwards. I'm the executive director of Opportunity Nation. We are a national bipartisan coalition of 250 national organizations, businesses, educational institutions, civic organizations that have come together to work on expanding economic opportunity and mobility in this country. Collectively, our partners work with, support, and, and nurture 100 million Americans in every corner of the country. United Way Worldwide, America's Promise Alliance, Jobs for the Future, Year Up, and CFED are among our partners in this work, along with businesses and higher education councils around the country. As many of you know, a child born today, a low-income child in Canada and many European countries, stands a better chance of improving his or her economic condition than they do a similar child born here in the US. We've spoken with young people around this country who tell us that in the zip codes where they're born, there are more smoke shops than grocery stores. And one young woman who told me that the numbers in her zip code, she felt, were going to be more important to her future than the numbers in her GPA. This is not our shared vision of the American dream. So at the core of Opportunity Nation is the idea that in America, no matter who you are, if you work hard, you should be able to improve your lot in life. Without opportunity, our country will never thrive. And we've learned that one of the most powerful factors in opportunity is making sure that young adults, aged 16 to 24, have a chance to stay in school and to work. And because we know how central this is, we are focusing on policies as an organization that can help make sure that more young people have a strong pathway to connect to education and employment. And there's actually bipartisan agreement about this idea, which is what today is really all about. We know that some form of post-secondary education and credentials are essential for young people to succeed. We must do all we can to make sure that young people have a chance to jumpstart the American dream. We're thrilled to be co-hosting this event with our friends at CFED, the leading voice in savings and asset development as a strategy to expand economic opportunity. The CFED team has invested significantly in the Opportunity Nation campaign serving our steering committee and helping inform our policy recommendations. And so for decades, CFED has really led the way in these issues, and I'm thrilled to have them with us here co-sponsoring this event. To speak more about their work and the specific policy ideas that are here today, I'd like to introduce the leader of this great partner organization, the president of CFED, Andrea Levere. Thank you, Mark, for those very kind words and the compelling introduction to why we are here today, which is a really common purpose of promoting college access and affordability through children's savings accounts. It has been a privilege to partner with Opportunity Nation over the last several years, given the close alignment of our missions and our commitment and capacity of your organization to reach millions of Americans with ideas that can build opportunity and assets. We are in solid agreement that access to educational opportunity is an essential ingredient to economic mobility in a global economy. While the belief in the power of education in the United States is undiminished, our ability to act upon this belief with effective policy innovations is lagging. And that is why we view the reintroduction of the American Dreams Account Act as a vital step in creating educational opportunity for the 21st century. 33 years ago, CFED was founded with a simple idea that every American should have a route into the economy to create a prosperous life. It was our obligation to provide these on-ramps into the economy and to provide the kind of incentives that worked for everyone, no matter where they started. Over a decade ago, we launched the first national demonstration of children's savings accounts to prove that savings accounts could be a tool to help break 
the intergenerational transfer of poverty and also to build aspirations and resources so that every child had the opportunity to afford post-secondary education. Since then, the research has shown that savings can break down barriers to college success. Researchers at Washington University in St. Louis found that even a small amount of savings can increase both the aspirations of students and the likelihood of college success. Among students who do expect to attend college, studies indicate that those with a college savings account are four times more likely to go to college, and if the account is in their no own name, six times as likely to go to college. Today, we find examples of innovation and passion for this idea all over the country, with policymakers at all levels of government seeing CSAs or children's savings accounts as a key ingredient to address the issue of college success, especially for low-income students. Today, you will hear about San Francisco's pioneering kindergarten to college program from the treasurer, Jose Cisneros, and from my colleague Lee Tivill on the panel later today, you'll hear about initiatives all over the country at the local, state, and federal levels that are implementing this idea. And while we all know there is no silver bullet to ending poverty, by starting with children, we have discovered that children's savings accounts can benefit the entire family. Since parents will often do for their children what they will not do for themselves. We have found that children's savings accounts encourage parents to get banked and save, further their own educations, and set the entire household on the route to greater financial security. But if we hope to realize the promise, potential, and scale opportunities so that we can serve every child that could benefit from these accounts, we must leverage the power of federal policy. And it is for this reason that it is now my great pleasure to introduce Senator Coons. Senator Coons was elected to the Senate in 2010, which capped a decade of successful service to the Newcastle County government. He served four years as the president of the Newcastle County Council and six years as the Newcastle County Executive. As the son and grandson of classroom teachers, and as a parent of three young children, Senator Coons has seen firsthand the transformative power of education. Before entering government, Senator Coons launched and ran a chapter of the National I Have a Dream Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to college success in East Wilmington, Delaware. And we're very happy to say that the partisan gridlock in Washington has not dissuaded Senator Coons from working with senators on the Republican side of the aisle to get results, and his work with Senator Marco Rubio to introduce the bipartisan American Dreams Account Act inspires us all. With that, Senator Coons. Well, thank you, Andrea, and thank you, Mark, and thank you um, to everybody uh, who's made the effort to come here from uh, around our country or even across the pond to join us uh, today in this hopeful, optimistic, promising conversation about what the American Dream Accounts Act might do and what is being done in places around the country, from San Francisco to states to cities to communities. I really do believe that if we're going to meaningfully address this fundamental challenge, the lack of access to higher education, which is both an economic issue, an opportunity issue, and in my view, a civil rights issue for the United States. If we're really going to address this in a meaningful way, we need the private sector, we need the public sector, we need the nonprofit sector, we need to all pull together to find reasonable, sustainable interventions that will make a lasting difference. And so, as Andrea said in the introduction, as someone who was both the son and grandson of classroom teachers and a parent myself, uh, you had me at hello in believing that education is one of the most important things we can be engaged in. Um, but I wanted to take a few minutes and share with you, if I could, just sort of what this experience was like at the Eye of a Dream Foundation and then how it informed my personal passion for this particular legislative idea. 
And I want to, if I might, just at the, at the outset, thank everybody who's been a part of bringing today together and who has labored so long in your own individual ways uh, to continue to make opportunity and education better and stronger for our country. To Mark, to Mark Edwards, to Opportunity Nation, thank you for what you're doing for your relentless focus on college access and affordability. Um, the 250 organizations that make up Opportunity Nation touch in different ways nearly 100 million people. And it was hugely encouraging to me to not just be part of your national summit, but to also uh, do a volunteerism day at Delaware State University in Dover and to see Mark both in settings grand and more practical and hands-on and to see the scope and reach uh, of your vision and your ambition. Uh, and to Andrea uh, and to everybody at the Corporation for Enterprise Development, which sounds really quite corporate, doesn't it? Um, thank you for what you do by bringing a data-driven analytical focus to the questions of how do we make smart investments that open better, broader doors for Americans and for hopefully folks around the world, because it is really my hope that by coming up with um, smart models and more inventive solutions that we might once again be a country to which other countries look for ideas about how to solve education and opportunity challenges rather than simply enduring a steady diminution of our global ranking as what we long enjoyed being a global leader in opportunity and today uh, a place that is diminished and where, as Mark said in his opening comments, there's countries all around us where the doors of opportunity are open and where folks are more likely to experience the American dream than here, the place that was in many ways the original author of it. Um, as has been said, your zip code really should not determine your future. So let me take uh, a minute, if I can, and just reintroduce you to some of what I experienced in 20 years with the I Have a Dream Foundation. I helped launch two different chapters. I worked for the national office. I served on the national board. And we touched about 15,000 um, children and families all across the country in more than 150 chapters, this foundation. And it was based on a very simple idea that a man named Gene Lang uh, really spontaneously um, followed, fell into when giving a commencement address at exactly the same middle school from which he had graduated in Harlem decades earlier. He was looking at a classroom full of kids and he was talking about his own life and how he had achieved remarkable things, to him unthinkable things from when he had sat in those exact same chairs. And it was really only because of a chance encounter when he was waiting tables that led to a college scholarship that made it possible for him to go to Swarthmore and then go on to be a very successful businessman and later philanthropist. And as he was talking to this group of young people and seeing sort of a lack of recognition of what he was even talking about, he realized that in those seats, in his own life, he never would have believed college to be possible. And so he made an individual promise to them that if Pell Grants or whatever other grants might be available from the state of New York or from the federal government aren't there for you, I personally, I will pay for your college education. Come meet me in my office. You'll get a letter from me. I'll get to know you and your families. It was an individual pledge to a specific group of kids. And I just want to say at the outset, it was that initial pledge that got the New York Times story and that was repeated often and is what most folks, if they know anything about I Have a Dream, know. There was this crazy guy who made a promise of a college education to a whole classroom full of kids in Harlem. But as someone who did that same thing myself and then was in the room over and over across the country as we launched other chapters, I know that that initial day and the response of parents and teachers in the community, while interesting, while engaging, while pressworthy at times, isn't what makes the difference. The 50 dreamers with whom my family and I worked on the east side of Wilmington um, grew up in a community and an environment where the possibility of college was really just not on their radar screen. Where day in and day out, messages, subtle and unsubtle, convinced them that college was something that was on TV, something that was connected with sports, something that was distant and unreachable, even if only a few blocks away. That college was not for them. And the first step, I think, that is most important about these accounts and about the idea behind the I Have a Dream program is to change that perception to have an answer to that question, how could I possibly make it to college? Well, we're gonna open the door of the affordability question. But that means nothing if it's not also married to persistent, broad engagement and intervention. The kind of work that is often really only possible through real people connecting to kids, to parents, to teachers, mentors, volunteers, community folks. And that staffing that and driving that and making that real is what most local I Have a Dream chapters really do over a dozen years, is invest in the people 
who do the work of weaving together lives of educational excellence for children in contexts where that didn't seem otherwise possible. I've never forgotten a meeting at the Ford Foundation where they looked at our results and they looked at this program and they said, this is fascinating, this is great, this is neat. But all you're doing is helping a few thousand kids. How could this possibly scale to solve the problems of our nation? How could you address a whole school, a whole community, a whole city, a whole country? And if you can't do that, why this is just some novelty that'll have a few dozen instances. Deeply frustrated by that conversation, haunted by it. I worked for another year and a half for the national office, traveling around the country and going to announcements, and struck over and over by what happens. When you ask, and you all know this, when you ask a room full of elementary school kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you dream of? No one says, I want to die young. I want to contract HIV AIDS. I want to be homeless. I want to be a drug dealer. I want to be shot in gang violence. No one ever says that. It doesn't matter what community you're in, you hear the same answers in this country. I dream of success, I dream of being a doctor, I want to be an astronaut, I want to be an NBA star, I want to be a race car driver, I want to invent something big, I want to be Bill Gates. Every school I've ever been in, I get the same answers. As you said, the critical difference is the answers that our society and our country makes possible or impossible. And so if I might then, in a few more minutes, what I think is most exciting about the American Dream account's idea is that it deploys modern technology. It deploys essentially a Facebook account on steroids to make possible the scaling that was impossible 20 years ago. And in a day where partisanship so often narrows and divides here in Washington, I am deeply grateful that Senator Marco Rubio of Florida, someone who came to this Senate the same time I did, um, who is from a different political background, a different regional background, but who shares my passion for opening the doors of educational opportunity in this country, has joined me, not just as the co-sponsor last year, but as a co-sponsor this year as we reintroduce the American Dream Accounts Act today. This bill encourages sustained long-term partnerships between schools, colleges, nonprofits, businesses. It would allow them to create individualized student accounts that are secure, web-based, personal, and portable, and that contain information about each student's academic progress, performance, and preparedness, their financial literacy, their college awareness, and their future career path. And it would connect them to high-impact mentoring and to an individual college savings account. Instead of forcing a motivated parent or an interested teacher or a concerned student to track down each of these resources, which in some states, like Delaware, are available and exist, but are completely siloed. Instead of forcing a motivated teacher or parent to find these things across many different resources and connect them, it connects them from beginning to end of the educational journey. The American Dream Accounts Act addresses long-standing challenges and barriers to college access connectivity, financial resources, early intervention, and portability. Let me briefly speak to each of these. Connectivity. One of the things I saw with the kids I worked with, we called them dreamers because it was the I have a dream program, from elementary school through high school through what had been hoped for college and in many cases was, but in many more not, was the impact of mobility. They all started in the same elementary school and by freshman year were in 14 different high schools scattered all over a broad area. And the simple transitions year in and year out that are accompanying poverty and the impact of that on any sort of relationship with classmates and with teachers and with mentors is a secondary but grindingly negative impact of poverty. So one of the things that this particular account would create is some connectivity. It would take advantage of technology and deliver these secure individualized hubs, a portfolio, an individualized dream record that allows a child to be known. Connecting that with a college savings opportunity, as Andrea said earlier, according to some studies, suggests that there are somewhere between a four and seven times greater likelihood of going to college. Because you've answered that first question. College isn't for me. How could I ever pay for it? Well, in a country where we literally spend billions of dollars federally to make higher education more affordable every year, why do we not tell children in a way that might change their attitude and their actions young? 
when the power not just of compounding interest but of compounding actions by them, their teachers, their mentors, their community, their parents, could have a huge positive cumulative impact. As you're going to hear in a few minutes from Jose Cisneros, San Francisco's Kindergarten to College Initiative is really laying an exciting foundation in helping students and families save for college from the very first day of school. But as I said before from my I Have a Dream experience, it's not just the savings, it's the changed attitudes and outlook that makes such a profound difference. In my view, it's that third part, that early intervention, that is in some ways most exciting. Because way before they figure out that a FAFSA form is impenetrable, <laughs> way before their eyes glaze over in some college guidance counselor's office, way before they see the dizzying array of catalogs and wander out to do something more interesting to a teenager, you've set in the mind that UNLV isn't just a place with a great basketball team, it's a place you might want to go to college yourself. That Penn State isn't just a place that plays football, or Temple isn't just a place where they have a great basketball team. You don't just hear about college in one context, you think of it as a place you might go and where you can see yourself. These accounts hold up a mirror to children that projects forward a brighter, more positive future picture of themselves. Last is portability. One of the things I saw most often about the kids I worked with was they moved and they moved into new classrooms where stressed out and overextended teachers dealing with 25, 30 kids really didn't get anything to work with virtually no information about the brand new student in their class in the middle of the year. No record of what they'd done in school, no sense of who they were or their context, no idea how to deal with them. And so young people themselves dealing with alienation from repeated movements from school to school to school, instead of having their full potential blossom, became a disciplinary problem, failed to achieve their full potential, failed to connect to that school, and so were even less engaged and less hopeful. The portability and the persistence of this information over the long educational journey is, in my ways, I think, some of the most powerful things about it. Let me just say, if I could, um, in conclusion, that I am really grateful um, to Rachel Bird, who works um, with my office. I'm just the pretty face. She's the brains of the outfit who makes this whole thing work. And we're going to give Rachel a round of applause. You know, it has been um, her persistent hopefulness about this that has sustained my engagement and hard work on it, and I just, I am so grateful uh, for everything you've made possible here. Um, I am also really grateful to some good friends uh, from Delaware who are in the room, uh, to Jocelyn Stewart, um, who has truly believed in this, uh, to Clint Walker and to everybody uh, with Barclays, uh, to Andrew and everybody who has invested time and effort and hope and energy in this, it is really only through a complete partnership, schools, businesses, the federal government, the local government, families, and communities, that solving this most nagging and fundamental problem of opportunity in our country is going to be possible. And so I cannot tell you what a gift this is. Um, to me personally, as someone who needs some encouragement every now and then, slogging through what is a 12-hour markup upstairs on the immigration bill. To all of us who serve in the Senate and need to see progress, and more than anything, to classroom after classroom of students all over this country uh, from whom I retreated 25 years ago, 20 years ago, when I could no longer stand the pain of watching as elementary school kids having been told that they were the newest classes of dreamers. I couldn't face the reality, the factual reality, that even with that intervention, we couldn't get all of them over the line. We couldn't secure for them health care and housing, hope and educational opportunity. This could make the single biggest difference in contributing to educational opportunity, to meaningful hope for millions, millions of students across this country. That is truly exciting, and that is a gift worth opening together. Thank you. Well, thank you, Senator Coons. I don't think we could have asked for a more inspiring and passionate endorsement of the whole idea and the actions that will make this possible for everyone. Um, and I think I speak for Albert Einstein when I accept the 
amendment that I love, as you know, he's often said the most powerful force in the universe was compound interest, but I love your reframing of compound actions. And I think that's a great frame for us because it takes a village to do all of this. So with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce my dear friend, um, Treasurer Jose Cisneros. In September 2004, Mayor Gavin Newsom appointed Jose Cisneros as the treasurer for the city and county of San Francisco. And as treasurer, he serves as the city's banker and chief investment officer, managing all the tax and revenue collection for the city. He was elected to a full term in November 2005, and we look forward to multiple terms. But what's most important to know about Jose and his outstanding staff, who is also here with us, is that they have been a pioneer and innovator at the municipal level to test out idea after idea about how we build financial security and opportunity within a city. How do we leverage the power of government, whether it's a bully pulpit, whether it's regulation, whether it's new sources of funds, to bring ideas to the citizens and residents of that city. Under his leadership, the city and county launched kindergarten to college as an effort to give every kindergartner in San Francisco a college savings account, thus giving them a 12-year head start towards college. We are proud to have played a supporting role in ma making this happen, and we are thrilled to have Jose talk about the program and share a little film clip. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you to CFED for being the pioneers to help make the Kindergarten to College program happen. And thank you also to Senator Coons for your leadership and your passion on this issue. I am Jose Cisneros. I'm the treasurer of the city and county of San Francisco, and I'm proud today to introduce an important new short film to you titled A Foot in the Door. This film documents the San Francisco's kindergarten to college program, the first universal, automatic college savings program in the United States. In San Francisco, we want every child to have the opportunity to save and invest in their future, so we created the kindergarten to college program. The program is a partnership between the Treasurer's Office of Financial Empowerment, the Office of the Mayor, the San Francisco Unified School District, a wide range of, of nonprofit partners, including our host, CFED, and philanthropists, and our financial partner, Citibank. Well, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and I'm excited to have such a powerful way to promote our work and the importance of children's savings for you today. The film really speaks for itself, so I'd like to first let you watch the film, and then afterwards, I'll come up and share a few more thoughts on the kindergarten to college program and why we think it's so important for San Francisco. Families work two or three jobs, they are not college educated, and they're immigrants. So it's harder for them. With liberty and justice for all. Because of the way the economy is so tight right now, everybody's in survival mode. Do we have enough to pay the rent this month? Do we have enough for food? Do we need to spend on any medical emergencies? People assume that everybody has savings and checking books, but we know that especially in poor neighborhoods, that doesn't happen. People go to check cashing places. They don't have accounts. They don't think that their kids could go to college because they can't figure out, how would we ever pay for college? For many, many years, our thought was it was remedial education that was getting in the way, that they weren't ready for college. Now we're finding it's financial insecurity that stops them from completing. And that leads to one of the most disturbing statistics I know, that only 8% of low-income students in the United States graduate four years of college by their mid-20s. That's a statistic we have to change, because it's not just 
their futures, but it's the future of this country. It's not good enough in this day and age for kids to just graduate from high school. Uh, what are you going to do with a high school diploma? Uh, kids are going to have to go to college to be competitive in, in the world economy. Traditionally, our culture has been, let's just get them to graduation and get them out the door. Well, that's not good enough in, in our society today. Now we have to be thinking about, okay, how are we going to instill in kids a culture that from preschool, they walk in to kindergarten and whatever, and they're thinking, I'm going to graduate from college. wanted to tackle work in the area of helping people save for their futures and, and, and really do what, what I think the experts call asset building. If you ask any parent, are you going to save for your child's college education? Um, everybody says, of course I'm going to, but things come up, you know costs spiral out of control and, and we don't get around to it. So we really wanted to find a way to particularly help the low-income families in the city to save for their kids' college education. We also were very inspired by some research that has been done recently that showed that if a child grows up with a college savings account in the child's name, that child is seven times more likely to go to college compared to a child without a similar account. There's no silver bullet to ending poverty, but our particular task is to turn the safety net into a ladder. And we are very convinced that children's savings accounts are one of those unique initiatives that not only help break the intergenerational transfer of poverty, but also change parents' lives while they change the lives of children. Because what we've discovered is that parents will do for their children what they won't do for themselves. with the idea, I thought, huh, this is too good to be true. Uh, th this isn't really going to happen. And then they started to show me all the evidence of what happens when kids do have accounts. And, and, and I was really amazed. And I, I, I really, quite frankly, got very excited about it. We needed to work with a strong financial institution who would be able to help us administer literally thousands of these accounts. We asked banks to tell us what they could do to service uh, our needs in this program. Thank you for backing with us. Have a nice day. Citibank, far and away, expressed the interest in really going that extra mile. There's something appropriate that we can do with our skills as a bankers in terms of community development. We know there's a growing number of people who fall outside the formal financial system. Platforms like these that are inclusive, universal, and that can be scaled are so important to trying to address that. All our management looked at it and thought this is a great challenge and one that we should be able to achieve. One of the challenges of the program was, well, how do you create a bank account for every child entering kindergarten at five years old? What name would the accounts be in? What about tax? Would they be taxed? How do you create effectively a trust fund? And who would be the trustee of these children's savings? And we came to the conclusion very early on, it'd be the city of San Francisco. And so we have created this program called Kindergarten to College, which is administered by the city, and which automatically opens up a college savings account for every child who enters the San Francisco public schools at kindergarten. Nothing at all required from the family. No signatures, no forms filled out, nothing. It's absolutely automatic. Welcome. Um, I'm so happy to see all of you. Bienvenidos, que está muy feliz para ver todos aquí. 
So you all know that all your children have $50 college savings and you can start putting in more, right? So they've got a great start to going to college. So you've all received this account in the mail, so you can start saving today. The account number is on here. It won't affect public benefits. It won't affect any immigration status. What about if we are saving the money, you know, when they're going to college, they don't want to go to college? These funds can be used for any educational purpose after high school, for training, for vocational education, computer, any kind of purchase related to education. The account's tied to the child, and you can have multiple people actually. You can have your grandparents, uncles, aunts. All you need is the account number, and you can all deposit separately into the account. You know, there's a lot of accounts out there that parents could set up, but in tough times, they raid those accounts. This is an account that can't be raided by anyone. And to be honest with you, I think parents are more motivated now to put money in because they realize that they can't touch it, that it truly is money for their children. One of the key first steps we're doing when we open up the accounts is we're putting an initial $50 deposit into the account, which is great. It makes the account real, but there's no way that $50 is ever going to amount to enough money to pay for college. We've actually raised um, private money to offer some, I think, important incentives, cash incentives, to the families so they are motivated to deposit funds into the account. We'll match every deposit they make into the account, dollar for dollar, up to the first $100 they put in the account. They have a chance, right off the bat, to double their money, essentially. We're also offering the Save Steady bonus. So you save a minimum of $10 every month for six consecutive months, and you get an additional 100 at the end of six months. If you're on free and reduced lunch, we're going to add another $50 to the account. We started at 18 of our core schools, so just about everybody in those schools qualified for free and reduced lunch. And so that's how it gets going. What I think is critical about the asset building approach is it basically says we're partners in this. If you can save, will then match your savings towards a goal that you set. Anybody who owns a house has a mortgage interest deduction, which is basically the government paying for part of their house payment. So this is just a different way for somebody who's not in a high tax bracket, who can take advantage of a tax deduction, to say, I think I'm gonna save for education instead, and start that process so suddenly you see a different future. college education. Mm -hmm. College is a big school after you graduate from high school, baby. You're in college or George? No, Papi, is, Papi needs to go back and finish, sweetheart. Fresh out of high school, I went to City College, um, and I was there for about a year and a half. My mother did set up a, a small savings account when we moved to the U.S., but it wasn't something that um, as, as dedicated as it should have been. So, are you going to make your deposit? Yeah. Welcome to City Bank. How can I help you today? I'm going to make a deposit into my daughter's account. What is your name? Mia Vasquez Fuentes. Thank you. How long is it? Since I opened up the account for Mia, I try to put myself where I'm depositing money into her account at least once a month. How much would you like to put in there? It's going to be 50 in that account. $50. It can be as little as 10, 15, 20 bucks, or, you know, 50, 60, 100 dollars. But it's just a consistency, because in the end, that consistency is what's going to make that account grow. And here's your receipt for that deposit. Perfect. Thank you very, very much. Say thank you, Mama. Thank you. Bye. The more I can save in that account, the more I know she'll have options to choose. She'll have a base to go, okay, I want to go here, instead of, okay, you know, did I qualify? You know, do I need financial aid? No, she has a base to already say, okay, this is, this, I want my foot in this door. I think we take for granted financial literacy. 
not to have tools to make financial decisions is a huge limitation. Financial access is important, but without financial literacy and capability, it's not enough. You guys are going to write what you learned going to the bank. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you learn? Tell me. Keep your money in the bank so you can save it for anything. We wanted every kid in a classroom to know they were all together and experience this savings phenomenon. Then a teacher could talk about the savings accounts knowing full well that every kid in the classroom has one. Because if everybody in your kindergarten class has an account, that's how life should be. And suddenly it's not a question, should I save? Should I do this? But everybody does. And then you have the extra education linked to the account. What I want to do is just review the other points before we start our unit on spending and saving. So In most educational settings, very little is taught about basic budgeting, how to write a check, how to open a checking account, or how to evaluate the multiplicity of credit card offers that you get as soon as you're 16 or 17. And those skills, the trouble you can get in, if you don't know that, is so much greater than the time it takes to teach it. Are you ready to go shopping? Yeah! Alrighty. Just make sure you have enough saved for those things that we really need later. Yeah. All the way from kindergarten, they're learning what money means and what savings means. Not only it reinforces our educational process in terms of math, but also the bigger picture is that it starts planning to see that they're going to go to college. The data clearly shows that kids who do put money in their accounts, the likelihood of them going to college just increases tremendously. And so it does make a difference. Welcome to our kindergarten graduation. spending in this type of a program, it's completely aligned with the kind of work that the city should be doing. Leslie Avalo. If we can have many times more kids, particularly low income kids that grow up in our city, be successful by having a chance to get to college or vocational school, I know the city's going to benefit from this. The return of having more kids educated, having fewer prisons, having fewer kids on the unemployment financially could have an impact not only here in San Francisco but in California and the country and I think that everybody ought to hop on and do this one because it's it's good for children and families. And so you have your I think it's really important to set high expectations right from kindergarten. Congratulations Mia, good job. You can do well. You can really achieve, no matter where you come from, no matter what your family background is, everybody has an equal opportunity. Now that it's in the parents' mind, parents will remember, the students will remember, and I think that it gives an additional edge to making that dream come true. Thank you very much for watching our film. And now be honest, raise your hand if you cried at all, even a little bit. See? See? As I said earlier, San Francisco, in San Francisco, we want every child to have the opportunity to save and invest in their future. And that's why we created the Kindergarten to College Program, the only universal automatic child savings program in the country. As of today, we have approximately 8,500 kindergarten, first, and second grade students enrolled in our program. And every year from this time forward, we will enroll 4,500 more each and every year as they enter public school. And that's right, 
as of this school year, every child entering our public schools at kindergarten automatically starts their whole academic career with a college savings account in his or her name. When we, when we designed the kindergarten college program, we knew that we, in order to advance the work, we needed to incorporate every one of the six elements identified by the field as being crucial to success. First, it had to be automatic. Every child receives an account automatically when they start school. And also, it had to be universal. Every child is eligible and accounts are open without any social security numbers or parent signatures, anything. It had to provide a seed deposit and a savings match. The account had to be real from day one. And it had to provide a range of deposit options so families could have access to the accounts and make deposits easily in person, by mail, or online. And we wanted it to be linked to financial education, taught right in the classroom so kids had a chance to learn and use the account as a tool to do that. And lastly, it had to be publicly funded. And we really think this last point is critical because we're trying to prove that this is the correct way for our government and governments in general to be spending their money. We're proud to be the first program in the United States to have launched a program that includes each of these measures of success, and we believe this is important for San Francisco and for the rest of the country. Let me tell you about how we're doing. In a little over two years, our families have saved over $280,000 of their own money that they have added to these accounts. And more than 55% of our savers are participating in the federal free and reduced price lunch program. So we know that the poorest families in our city are engaging with the account. And almost a third of our savers have saved every month for at least six months, and they have earned their Save Steady bonus. The program is proving very popular with families. We're going to re release a report later this month with our partner, Earn that found many exciting um, results, amongst other things, that said that 73% of families claim they're likely to make a deposit within the next year. Now, I want to be honest with you. I'm probably making this sound uh, like it was all way too easy. And believe me, it was anything but easy. Uh, let me tell you, securing public dollars for a new innovation like this during a recession, not easy. Overcoming regulatory hurdles to design an account that could be automatically opened for 4,500 five-year-olds each year, also not all that easy. And reaching out each year to thousands of families to encourage them to put their limited resources into a new savings program, also not all that easy. So why are we making this investment in these economic times? The short answer is we know we want our families and our children in our city to go to college. We also know that when given the right products and the right incentives, even lower income people can and will save. And lastly, we think we know and we're gonna try and prove that savings provides the future thinking that our kids need in order to make it to college and successfully through college. However, there's a reason that we're here with you today when we could be hired at work back in San Francisco trying to make our program successful. And a major goal of our program is to demonstrate that it's programs like this that are a necessary and important role for government. My dream is that we'll be so successful in San Francisco that we'll help prove the concept and that children's savings accounts will be broadly adopted at the state and federal level. Kindergarten to college is gonna be a big win for children in our community, but we wanna see every child in this country have the same chance for success. And that's why I, want to be, I wanted to be here with you today, to let you know that this type of work is absolutely achievable, that this is the right thing to do, and that we can make it happen not only for kids in San Francisco, but for kids all across this country. I, I, I really hope you enjoyed watching our film today. If you'd like to learn more about the Kindergarten to College program, please go to our website for the, for the San Francisco Office of Financial Empowerment, sfofe.org and we will have our new research paper there posted later this month. Also, on uh, May 23rd, we'll be uh, we will be participating in a webinar hosted by the Cities for Financial Empowerment Coalition where we'll be talking about the Kindergarten to College program. And I'll be sticking around after the panel if any of you have any other questions today. Thank you for your time. I 
am absolutely thrilled to introduce Jamira Burley, a recent graduate of Temple University with dual degrees in international business and legal studies. She currently is the executive director of the City of Philadelphia's Youth Commission. She is dedicated to ensuring that students have a voice on issues that impact them. We at Opportunity Nation are thrilled to call her one of our opportunity leaders. Jamira. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to first thank Opportunity Nation and CFED for convening everyone here today, but also for allowing me to be a part of such an important issue. As mentioned, my name is Jamira Burley, and um, yes, I am a recent graduate of Temple University, so the Isles is my alma mater. Um, and as mentioned, I am the executive director for the City of Philadelphia's Youth Commission, which would make me, at 24, the youngest executive director for the City of Philadelphia. For those who may not know, the Philadelphia Youth Commission is comprised of 21 young people between the ages of 12 to 23 that advise the mayor and city council on issues that impact nearly the 600,000 young people in Philadelphia under the age of 25. Now, I stand here before you um, as a young person who not that long ago can be considered one of the 54% of young people in the United States living in a household of either um, impoverished or low income. That changed in May of 2012 when I became the first of 16 children to graduate from high school and college. But that, was, um, but that, that path was not an easy one. I come from a drug and violent infected community where for many, making it out was either death or prison. I grew up watching both of my parents and all 10 of my older brothers become repeat ex offenders. So when I was 17 years old, two years after the murder of my 20 year old brother Andre, and two years after the murder conviction of my father for a separate crime, I knew that I could um, do more and I wanted more. With the help of a mentor, I started to believe that a college degree was a possibility for me, even though none of my predecessors had achieved it before. And I must say, um, I applied and I got in. But for many who may think that applying to college is hard, that for me was actually the easy part. Um, after the congratulations and the acceptance letters came in, paying for college became all too consuming. I, unlike many of my peers, was actually pretty lucky. I was able to receive a few scholarships and I was able to work full time through the School District of Philadelphia um, to help supplement um, college costs. And I was able to graduate, yes, um, with debt, um, but much less than many of my peers. Um, or should I say for many of my peers who were able to graduate. The number one reason why young people drop out of college is for lack of funds which is all too much of a reality for me then as it is now considering the um, population of young people I work with. Through my years in school, I watched as many of my friends and my peers drop out of school and lose the battle with financial aid because neither they nor their parents knew how to cope with the financial cost that will come with paying for college. Who is mostly affected by this phenomenon? Low income and first, generational students, first generation students. Only one in 10 will graduate before the age of 24, and some never will. So if we ask ourselves, what is the type of world that we wish to create? One that is flourishing, productive, and safe. We know we can't get there until we allow and we make sure that every young person has the potential to fulfill their, to the, the, um, the possibility of fulfilling their full potential. And as a society or as a globe, I guess you can say, that values a college education, we know they can't get there without a degree. So this is why I think it is imperative. Um, imperative that the American Dream Account Act is passed in Congress because it will allow parents and students to get ahead of the financial responsibility early in their child's life. It would also make sure that parents and students become financially knowledgeable about the options that are available to them. This bill has the ability to recreate an environment that is not just a college-going culture, but really a college-graduating culture. Because as mentioned earlier, we know that young people are four times more likely than their peers to graduate from college if they have savings already dedicated to them before starting. The late Malcolm X once said, that education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. So if we don't start today, what does that say not only for the future of young people, but also the future of this country? I don't know about you, but I am not going to wait around to find out. If it can be done, it should be done. Thank you.
as we've all heard today, we know that the economic success for a family is education. And a key to that is ensuring that young adults have opportunities beyond high school graduation. I am really excited about the panel we have here today with us to talk about the important role of college savings and asset development paired with mentoring and financial literacy. They're all going to talk about the work that they're doing from their unique perspectives. We have Lee Tivill, who is CFED's Director of Savings and Financial Security. Lee has spent her entire career in asset, in asset building fields with more than 15 years of policy and program experience. Cindy Wallace is the Vice Chancellor for Student Development at Appalachian State University. Cindy is an educator who has served Appalachian State for 28 years and has sought to ensure that the undergraduate experience is improved. Jocelyn Stewart directs community relations efforts for Barclay Card US. Since the company's founding in 2000, she has developed community strategy and managed Barclay's volunteer and financial resources to achieve Barclay's community goals. And we have Emily Boak, who is a legislative aide to Senator Marco Rubio. As legislative aide, she is responsible for advising the senator on key policies and legislation concerning education, while also working to promote policy initiatives like the American Dream Accounts Act. Lee, do you want to start us off? Thanks, Melanie. Um, we're delighted to be here. As, as you heard from Andrea, CFED has been part of this field since really it's the, the very beginning of, of the, the child savings field, and we're, we're truly honored to be participating now in some of the, the emerging efforts that are going on across the country. Um, and uh, I've been asked today to uh, kind of offer a little bit of, of a description of the landscape of child and college savings initiatives that are emerging uh, around the nation. You know, this is an idea that was first pioneered, as Andrea said, nearly 10 years ago in our first national demonstration of kids' accounts. And since then, our friends in San Francisco have truly led the way in pioneering this kind of work at much larger scale. And that has sparked significant excitement around the country in this area to the extent that now there are child savings programs in various stages of development underway in, in literally a couple of dozen communities around the country. This is truly an idea that has, as we saw today with Senator Kuntz, has captured the imaginations of leaders at the federal, state, and local levels. Um, before I kind of offer some, some examples of what that's looking like, I want to start by sharing a few general trends that we're seeing in these kinds of initiatives across the country. First, we're seeing that most of the emerging initiatives are not designed as standalone savings programs. Rather, they are being embedded into existing large systems that are already reaching great numbers of kids and families where they are, schools, college readiness programs, early childhood settings, those kinds of places. And each of these is seeking to achieve the universal goal that Jose described in their own way, serving every child in a particular school, in a particular community, even in a particular classroom. The second trend is that, uh, again, sort of following the path of, uh, of San Francisco's leadership, we are seeing public sector involvement present in almost every emerging child savings program, particularly those at meaningful scale. And, and the, the, that presence varies widely. It might be city or county government, a school district, a housing authority, a Head Start program. But in almost every one of these initiatives, there's a public sector role somewhere. And then third, we're seeing a focus not just on kids, but also on their parents, and a heavy emphasis from day one on strategies to keep kids and their families engaged in the programs and generate savings. We have learned that it's not enough just to open an account and hope for the best. We've got to ensure that we're touching kids and families at various points along the way and supporting and encouraging them to save, and that includes providing the financial education that they need to make the most of the opportunity. So I'm very briefly going to share a couple of examples of initiatives that are emerging at the federal, state, and local levels here. I want to just offer the caveat that these are good examples, but they are by no means a comprehensive list of everything that's out there. So just a quick sampling. Federally, of course, the exciting legislation like the American Dream Accounts that you've heard about today. Again, we're just delighted about this. But we're also seeing um, agency level interest in the federal government. A, a notable example is through the Department of Education and their Gear Up initiative, gaining early awareness and readiness for undergraduate preparation. This is their college readiness program for seventh graders and on up. Uh, the department is looking to embed savings and financial education into gear up programming in a number of exciting ways. At the state level, 
In Colorado, the head of the state's Department of Human Services is working with CFED and the Aspen Institute's uh, Ascend program to design a two-generation child savings program that could serve as many as 10,000 kids a year in the family's child care program for working families. This is still in development, but what's really exciting is that it's coming through the state agency. It's the first time we've seen it at this, this kind of thing at that scale. And also this two-generation approach that is also going to offer asset building tools and services to the parents as well as the kids. In other parts of the country, there are 15 states currently that incentivize deposits into 529 college savings accounts for low-income families. Uh, and, and there are some states that are even going above and beyond. In the last uh, month or so, the Nevada State Treasurer announced plans to open a college account for every kindergartner in 13 of the rural counties in that state. And then locally, we're seeing a lot of other innovation, again, sparked in large part by our friends in San Francisco. Cuyahoga County in Cleveland uh, was inspired to develop universal accounts for all kindergartners, and they've recently passed legislation to do that. It's going to reach about 14,000 kids a year in public, private, charter, and parochial schools. In Jackson, Mississippi, the mayor has been a champion for the last several years. We've embedded, we've worked with the city there to embed children's accounts into the city's uh, municipally run early childhood programs. Great story about this recently on the PBS Need to Know program. And in the Puget Sound in Washington State, the Seattle, King County, and Tacoma uh, public housing authorities are in the design process for a pilot. So we're really seeing a tremendous diversity of stakeholders that are coming to the table and saying this is something we think is an important missing piece of the puzzle for our communities. Again, I'm barely scratching the surface of what's happening across the country, but uh, this is a, a sort of a first taste for you of the growing momentum in the field nationally. So I get to be the educator up here, um, and have been doing this for a while, and, and I can't tell you how exciting it is to have these financial partners in the room because we desperately need you. Uh, if there has been one story that's resonated across the United States in the last few years, it has certainly been that college debt, and Jamira just shared her personal story of that, has been um, a problem that is, that is more and more evident as tuition and fees um, rise in states, and I might add, the primary reason that they are rising is because state appropriations are dropping. I am from a public school in the beautiful mountains of North Carolina, part of the UNC system. And we have had a great tradition in North Carolina of supporting higher education at a very high level. Um, our, my friends from California are one of the other states for whom affordability, uh, we generally rank fairly high. But these last four or five years have brought economic challenges that few states have been able to cope with, not to mention our municipalities and others that we are sharing the, the conversation with today. But at Appalachian State, we have a long, rich history of serving an underserved region. We are in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains. And part of our legacy has been that of educating first-generation low-income individuals. While our history has changed um, a great deal over the last 100 years, the growth of that group of students, that is the demographic that is facing us in waves coming into college. Um, they are our first generation students. And I think the question that has been placed here today is how do we respond to that? And one of the things my university decided to do was to make as one of its signature programs an access program. And it is our commitment to college education and student success. And it is a debt free commitment. And what we are doing is leveraging all of the kinds of, of possible support um, represented by people here with me today and discussed here in this, in this room. And for many of you I know that are in the audience have been very much a part of these discussions. Federal aid is absolutely our foundation. The Pell Grant is the defining um, federal program of the greatest financial need. For our access program, it's an estimated family contribution of zero, which means that family of four is earning approximately $23,000. Now, you tell me how you eat every month, much less um, save and support a child going to college. But with our students that we bring in every year, this is our commitment to them. And we look at building that financial aid package from Pell eligibility to our state need-based aid, any discretion, the third category that the university has in discretionary funds, and that differs widely from university to university and state to state. 
And that fourth category are these amazing areas of public support. Where do we raise private dollars? And that has been a commitment of, of our university in a comprehensive campaign. So we combine those very important investments. We build that package for that student, and it differs for every single student. And many of you in this room may have helped finance your own college education by doing that. A higher percentage of these students work than national average. 82% of our access scholars work. Our retention rates, our graduation rates, and their academic success either equals or exceeds that of an average student at Appalachian, even though their academic readiness profile through high school grades, et cetera, may not be as high. And you would ask why is that when their obstacles have been so much greater? It is because of that second piece that we're talking about, about how you build a support program. The dollars are critical. No one can go to college without them. But if we don't match that, with the kind of deep mentoring, the coaching, and the support, we cannot be successful here. And that huge default rate from colleges and that issue that students are dealing with, largely it is because they are not degree completers. That's another part of the data, the, the, the deep analytical approach to doing a program like this that we know. Um, as Lee just said, we stand on the shoulders of our Gear Up colleagues. We were one of the first Gear Up grant universities in the United States. We've been part of TRIO education since the 70s and part of our great society that said we must extend the option of higher education to those that have not been afforded that luxury. Because back then it was more like a luxury and as you've discussed today, it's a reality for all of us. Um, you can call it selfish or you can call it altruistic, but unless we meet this need, indeed our, our communities and our nation will suffer. So we build in the deep mentoring and the coaching. We hire grad students to be mentors that meet with each one of our access students every single week. They help pay their way through college, again, extending that circle that does the, uh, so much good. It is wonderful. Jamira will be twice as powerful with a college freshman um, as perhaps some of us uh, elder individuals or more experienced folk in the room because of that relational place I've walked in your shoes I fought that struggle I have found a way to be ready for that test but why do we need so much more support here and I think it is even with the kind of financial support that we are bringing to bear every year in squeezing every possibility out of federal and state dollars, discretionary funds, and finding amazing private partners every year for whom this is a priority. There are incidental costs along the way that are very hard for these students to find the money for. It is critical that we help them along that path. They don't have a safety net. They cannot email their parents and ask for additional funds. And I think that our data and that deep place that we should all go in terms of accountability of showing how these, um, these programs work, I think that's that transformative place that's wonderful for me to get to work every day. Um, I will end because we have this little, uh, we've got those little signs up here in the front. But as we, um, Part of the thing that I think we have to pay attention to that is going to be critical with this savings account notion, there are some key federal policies that need to change. And in building a financial aid package for a student, currently you are penalized if there is any money out there in there that has to count towards your family's statement. The FAFSA is a bear. We're trying to help with that process, but summer jobs money that is coming from a wonderful program like the kindergarten to college we have got to change federal policy so that that individual is not penalized and that money truly can be used to support their education i'm going to fly home to north carolina tonight and i will get to watch an access scholar named seth walk across the stage on saturday seth has come from a family that has absolutely no ability to help him he's made a decision to not heat his house for the last two years, and trust me, I live in a cold clime. Um, the uh, average temperature in the winter is, is in the 20s and the 30s, and we get a lot of snow. So Seth went without heat 
in order to maximize his access dollars. He is going to graduate with a double degree in uh, sustainable development and supply chain, man uh, chain management. He has a fabulous job at 23, having worked every single week of his life to get through college. He will have the first financial security he has ever had. That's not just changing Seth's life, he's changing a generation. And I deeply appreciate the chance from Opportunity Nation, from our wonderful financial colleagues, and encourage all of us to work harder to do more. Thank you. So I'm from Barclays, and we are new kids on the block in this arena. Um, we've actually been talking to Senator Chris Coons for years about this, um, but really weren't in a place where we thought we could actually help the way we wanted to. Um, some things have changed at Barclays, all for the good, especially if you sit in my seat, but we have a new CEO, and he is committed to being a different kind of bank. He has publicly stated our values, which include stewardship and respect and integrity, and this is the perfect project for us to work on. So that being said, the idea is where do you start? I mean, the issues, as you've heard today, start as early as kindergarten and go all the way through getting through college but we want to maximize our resources and the skills that we can bring. And so we looked at the entire continuum and it became apparent to us that where we thought we could do the most help is in that later time where kids are in college but they can't get through college. I have a dear friend who I just found out is Cindy's friend, um, a person named Dr. Uh, Harry Williams who runs Delaware State University. And the first time I spoke to him, he said, uh, I said, what are your greatest challenges? And he didn't even hesitate. He said graduation rates. At Delaware State, 35% of the kids that start freshman year will ever graduate. And that to me was shocking. Then when we started digging into this issue, again, it became apparent through the Monitor Institute, which um, was mentioned in the film, that if you live in the lowest income quartile, less than $36,000 a year, 70% of those kids will graduate from high school, 60 will start college, but only 8% will ever graduate. And even if you go up to the next income quartile, which is less than $65,000, only 16% will ever graduate. And when you ask why, I mean, what is the main driver? It's financial. But many instances, it's little amounts of money, relatively speaking. It's under $500. No one should have to drop out of college for less than $500, especially if you've been brought up in poverty, you've made it through high school, you've made it into college. So Barclays is committed to trying to help do that. So how are we going to do it? We're going to create a website that helps kids get mentally and financially prepared for college. And again, we are not experts in this. So we have talked to many people in this room. We have brought in kids from Delaware State that are employed with us right now. We have a cohort of teachers. We have students from high school that are working with us. We have a guy from Zynga who's working with us on how to engage kids. We are talking to anybody who can help us really make this work. But basically the idea is sort of virtual mentoring. To your point, Cindy, it was, it's really you know kids talking to kids. So can I get kids that are being successful getting through college, going back and talking to kids in high school? How did you do it? Where are the tricks? What made it work for you? How did you get financial aid? Really just helping to guide each other through the process. Um, so that's the, the first piece of it. It'll also have goal setting, but we're not gonna be big content drivers. We will send people to other websites. There are fabulous websites out there, but most of it is adults pushing information on kids. So if we can get kids talking to kids about how the successful ones are doing it, we hope that we can really make a difference there. And then creating a savings product. Again, we you know, are trying to do this on a national level so we don't have all the resources that's going on in San Francisco. But again, really rewarding people for good saving behavior. So there'll be incentives when you save you know, six months in a row. In a, in a row. There'll be incentives if you don't take withdrawals. There'll be incentives if you hang in there for two years. Again, all sorts of financial incentives to get these people engaged in saving not huge amounts of money. We're talking about goals of like $250 to $400, that sort of thing. And we'll also offer a 529 on there. It won't be a Barclays product. We don't have one. 
but we are really hoping this works. We know that's the best vehicle to save, but quite frankly, lots of people in poverty are afraid of that. There's real reasons to be you know, nervous about it, but then there's also urban legends. So we also have to educate people. We want it to be out there, we want to offer it, but it wouldn't be our product. So um, we are going to start this in uh, September. Uh, we will be out there, we will pilot it in Delaware. The hope is to take it on national level. We are not going to overdevelop it. We are going to do this so that we can make a lot of changes to it, so we can react to how the kids react. Um, but the idea is to figure out how to do it in Delaware and then take it on a national level. We want to be part of the solution here, um, and we are going to do our best. If anybody in here, like I said, we know we're not the experts, so we will take ideas, constructive feedback from anybody here about you know, ways that you think we can make this a better product. Um, but at the end of the day, we don't want any child to have to drop out of college for $400. Hi, good afternoon. I just want to say thank you to Melanie and Opportunity Nation and CFBD um, for putting this on today. This is such a great panel. Um, and to Rachel and Senator Coons for introducing the American Dream Accounts Act that we're very excited to be a part of. Um, I'm sorry that Senator Rubio couldn't be here today, but I wanted to share with you guys briefly why the Senator is very excited to be a part of this bill um, and these efforts. If the Senator were here, he would tell you his story about um, coming from a family of modest means and attending a public university and then later graduating from a private law school. And the Senator did this with the help of federal financial aid, including Pell Grants and various loans and accumulated over $100,000 of student loans um, at the end of his educational career. Um, so Senator Rubio knows firsthand how important it is to have not only access but support in attending college um, and whatever kind of post-secondary graduation that you would like to attend. Um, and the Senator really is supporting the American Dream Accounts Act as a part of his commitment to promoting social and economic upward mobility in this country. Um, one thing that the Senator and I have in common is we are both student athletes, and um, although our college careers were, were brief, I think that one of the things that is exciting about the bill is the encouragement that the partnerships and the collaboration that the American Dream Accounts have um, but on children. Uh, when you're an athlete, you have coaches and parents and teammates and a lot of collaboration and encouragement, uh, not to mention the financial assistance that your parents pay to whatever club or organization you um, attend. And so you have all this incentive to succeed. Um, and I think that that's a really important and exciting piece of the legislation um, to encourage kids from such a very early age. There are people who are invested in you. You may not even know these people. They could be complete strangers, but they're investing their time and their money um, in your success and that really anything is possible um, in terms of your college education. Um, so just to conclude, I think you know, we're really excited about supporting the American Dream Accounts Act and working with other colleagues here in the Senate. And um, we thank you guys for your support and for coming. Um, and we're looking forward to watching the bill move forward here. So I want to open it up for questions in just a minute, but I had a couple of questions for the panel. Um, one thing that struck me watching that amazing video and listening to you all talk was the important role the private sector played. Um, how do you encourage greater private sector participation and funding so that you ensure that there's real impact with what these accounts do? A anyone? It's a, it's a great question. Um, I think uh, we certainly see the need for, as you, as you note, funding, which I think has to be a blend of public and private. Um, uh, we also see the need for the infrastructure that has frankly not grown, the, need, the, the infrastructure needs have not kept pace with the interest of the field. So it's encouraging to hear about the you know, new account products and City has this great product that they've been sharing, but what we know is that we, we, we don't yet have a, a nationally available product that is, uh, as the Senator said, portable and, and uh, online and easy to use. Um, we need to make sure that, that regulatory policy actually encourages rather than discourages that. I think there's a lot that, for instance, the financial regulators could do to make sure that financial institutions know uh, what their parameters are in opening these kinds of accounts, making sure that they get the right kinds of credit for doing that, and also that, that, uh, that on the other side of the policy house that we remove uh, certainly the financial aid barriers that savings can create, but also the barriers for, for, on the, for lower income families who are receiving public benefits. We want to make sure that they uh, aren't punished 
for saving for college by then losing public benefits for which they might otherwise be eligible. So I think there's a lot that on the policy front we can do, certainly on the market side, as you had asked, but also in some other really critical areas. Cindy or Jocelyn? You tell the stories. You have Jamiras. You have the folks that um, Senator Coons talked about and broke his heart over and over again until he had to walk away because it was too painful. If you want to make investment relevant, it's all about human beings. And I think we have, if we talk about wanting to scale these programs, there is not one of you in this room that does not know of hundreds and hundreds of these amazing young people whose stories need to be told because in aggregate, they're the ones that are gonna change the face of this discussion. Um, Emily, this question is, is really directed at you. You have a room full of passionate advocates here who are very supportive of what Senator Rubio and Senator Coons have done. What can we do as a group to ensure this bill becomes reality? Thanks, that's a great question. And um, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of things that you guys can do, but most importantly, um, this is one of the greatest things that you guys are doing is just showing your support and showing up here and um, letting your representatives in Congress know that you're excited about this idea, uh, what this idea and opportunity would mean for children in your community, children and families in your community. Um, so I would encourage you to contact your legislators. Um, you know, those emails and those letters really do go somewhere and those phone calls, they all get recorded and um, they mean a lot to the senators. Their encouragement and they're showing what support we have back in our communities and back in our states. Um, and just to continue the conversations, I mean, it's really exciting to see the collaboration between so many different groups and financial sectors and Congress and Opportunity Nation and um, groups around the country. So please just continue your advocacy. This is the hard work. Um, you guys travel a lot and you guys have a lot of meetings, and, but it really does mean a lot at the end of the day. I could keep asking questions of you guys, but want to make sure I open it up to the audience. Um, we have a microphone, I believe, that, that's wandering around. Um, raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the panelists. Uh, I had a question for Jose Cisnero, so would there, can I ask that now? Okay. Um, Jose, join us. I was just curious if you could explain the, how the savings account will affect the FAFSA form and, uh, for those students where they will have to fill out parent contribution and because they are penalized now for having any income if they're... Sure, yeah. sure, sure. We're looking at that. Um, our, our, our account holders are in kindergarten, first and second grade now, so fortunately we have a little time <laughs> to figure out how quite that's going to work out or maybe even change some of the policies. One of the things we were actually more, um, I, so I, I don't know exactly the answer to how we're going to um, find that it's going to work. Right, right now, the way that we think it's going to work is because this, these accounts are set up in the name of the city and county of San Francisco, where ultimately our property, we see it as an educational gift at that time that they, they actually don't have to report as their own asset honestly when they're filling out that form or any other documentation about what the family's assets truly are. We find that that's even um, critical today because to the point that um, just got brought up, there are many families that have um, you know, benefit uh, limits and criteria. And again, um, our concern was that these savings were to in any way change that, that landscape for them. We might see some impacts that we didn't want to have. Again, because when the monies come into the account, they're actually coming into account ultimately owned by the city and county. These don't show up on the balance sheets of those families. Do you guys want to add anything? I would love to add something to that. So I want to just uh, applaud the city and county of San Francisco for being willing to serve as the custodian of these yeah. accounts for that reason. But I want to underscore what a huge undertaking that is. And in every community where we're trying to get kids' savings up and running, we have to go ask the same question. Who could serve that role? And the reason we have that role is not because we want a custodian. It's because we have policy artifacts that are making the custodian necessary so that lower income families aren't being punished for saving for their children's future. So I, I just want to underscore the need for, to address the kind of underlying cause of that custodial role. And I would also add that it's not, you know, for us, it's looking doing it on a national level, it really comes down to a state by state basis. So it's not, I mean, it is 
it is so complicated and we have spent months trying to figure out the FAFSA form and the effects to benefits and you know if a bunch of bankers can't figure this out I mean I, I don't know who can so we are um, right with you on trying to help make this a little bit easier any other questions with microphones coming right behind you so um, 10 years from now, 12 years from now, when these kids are getting ready to graduate from high school, what if they are not going to go to any kind of other educational program? Who, it, will the trustee of will San Francisco get to have that money then, and will they distribute it as incentives, or how are they, you know, to other students? Excellent question. So our, the way our program is going to work is we're bringing in all this money, and yes, it's, because it's going into the account of the city and county of San Francisco. The structure is actually uh, a custodial account with a whole se series, literally thousands, of sub-accounts connected to the custodial account. Um, each child's uh, savings go into those accounts and any of the incentive matches and, and, and other things similar to it that we create in the future. If the child uh, actually turns by the time the child turns 25 and is no longer a child um, and doesn't use the money or, or all of the money for an educational purpose, at that time the account will be closed and any of the family money, any of the money that the child put in, the family, any, any non-program money or city money will be given to the 25-year-old at that time. So they do ultimately get to keep all of their money. Any of the matches, the incentives, things like that, which we were really putting there to, to support the college the educational purpose, any of those would come back into the program and we'd use that to support some other child's college education or educational purpose. So we want to make sure we treat everyone fairly. Well, could it be transferred to a sibling? Again, at, at, the, t at the time that the person turns 25, it'll go back to that, the 25-year-old who could do whatever he or she wants with it. Is there a beneficiary on the count? So, for we example, if the person dies? Uh, right again. Right now, it's in the name of the child, and it, it will. Right. You know, that's where the sub account goes. Right. Um, again, we have a little time to figure out, but probably in the case of an actual um, passing of a child, that we it would be the family that would receive the family funds that were put into the account. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, this is just a follow-up question for San Francisco. What unique identifiers do you have um, since they're seamlessly enrolled? And I know it's such a transient population. Mm -hmm. Students often have similar names and things. How mm -hmm. do you ensure without something like a social security number, which is really cumbersome to collect, that the money upon withdrawal will actually go to the correct student? Or what have you built in, I guess? You, you, you asked such an important question because as I talked about the regulatory hurdles of setting up this, this program, certainly the banking know your customer rules, right, are, are critical in doing anything of this type of thing. Fortunately, we, we landed with Citibank's partnership and a lot of legal help um, um, from, from very learned people. We landed on the custodial account purpose, but even still for the sub accounts, we needed to have enough information to show that we could identify who the account holder was. The, the saving, the, the, the real lifesaver for our program is the partnership of the school district. The school district, when it enrolls each student, has enough information to uniquely identify that student for all the right educational, federal benefit, re all those reasons. So what they are able to share with us, and I think it's not insignificant that they're sharing it with us as another local government uh, entity, they are able to share with us the child's name, the date of birth, the home address, and the name of parent or guardian. And it's those four pieces of information that they have that help allow us to uniquely identify that child and continue to hold this account in his or her name. Follow up right here. Um, how will the actual um, withdrawals, the determination that it is a qualified expense, how does that part work? Again, we have a few years to figure this out, fortunately. But our thinking right now is there's already criteria set up for the federal 529 program, which we understand is very broad, very comprehensive. It's almost any educational purpose, as you heard us quote, quote in the film, anything, supplies, 
housing, food, tuition, you name it, vocational school, um, anything a, 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 a student wants to tackle, we want to make sure that the funds are there for that purpose. So our plan is to pretty much mimic the 529 um, eligibility. We have gone past our time, so maybe one more question. Anyone? <laughs> There's one in the back, too. There's one. Wait, Lizzie, behind you. Oh, All the way in the back. Thanks. I think this question would be directed to Lee, but I'm just, we, we've heard a little bit about Cuyahoga County and Colorado, Puget Sound, Nevada. I was just curious if there are any important differences between the model in San Francisco and these other experiments going on. That's a great question. San Francisco has, has definitely served as the inspiration, uh, as uh, the, their staff can tell you, based on all the phone calls that they get asking for information. Um, but I will say the, the approaches are different in every community. Um, as much as we might like for this to be a cookie cutter model that we could just sort of rubber stamp into each different place, the, the fact is that the players are different, the financial institutions are different, the resources are different in every community. So while there are some core elements, like you know, there's an account, there's typically a custodian, there's a program manager, there are savings incentives, those things are consistent across the board. Uh, the, the, the details really do need to be and have been customized for every community. Every place needs to do this in a way that fits uh, the kids and families that they'll be serving. Can I add one other thing there? An interesting model is sometimes you go with where your donor is. We have a small mountain county down near Asheville with an um, Appalachian alum who has been incredibly successful. And he looked at some of the great research that um, Ed Trust and others have done, um, the Lumina Foundation, that third and fourth grade math scores are incredibly indicative of future success. So this individual in this county offered a full ride to Appalachian to third and fourth graders in this particular school system with the highest end of grade math scores, and we now have eight of them. This happened a decade ago, and we have eight that have matriculated to Appalachian and our grads in things like actuarial sciences. Who figures that out when you're in the third or fourth grade? <laughs> so to Lee's point, sometimes you go where your donor is or you go where that private entity has a very vested interest in a particular area, and they help you define it. Um, and, and I think we shouldn't ever underestimate that serendipitous connection. As you can see, there's a lot of interest in this topic, and we probably could have sat here for many hours and, and continued to, to talk with each other. Thank you all so much for participating on the panel. I um, want to have Mark Edwards come up here and close us out. Thank you again for coming. Uh, this is a great day for us. Thank you, Treasurer Cisneros, for your remarks. Thank the panelists, great panelists. Thank you. Uh, as we heard, uh, now is where the hard work starts. Um, Opportunity Nation has a new advocacy page. Um, hope you check it out to give, you, um, to give us uh, help in, in making sure that we can actually take this idea and make it real. So really appreciate your engagement. Stay in touch.